So welcome everybody. Um, thanks for staying or joining online. We're um, really glad to have Donald Dennison and I realize I don't have your name. That's okay, Jackie Yarmel. Jackie Yarmel, um, who are both elder law attorneys and are going to um, talk to us about end of life planning um, and elder care. Um, so I'll turn it over to them, but thank you very much for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Um, can everyone on Zoom hear us as well? Yes. Very good. All right. Thanks for joining in. All right. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Reverend Katrina mentioned, my name is Donnie Dennison, and I'm an elder law attorney at Mandelbaum Barrett in Roseland. Um, and this is my partner, Jackie Yarma, who is also an elder law attorney. Um, there's some, I guess, misunderstanding about what elder law is, because the name implies that it is, you know, catering to the elderly population. But we typically tell people that elder is somewhat of a broad um, word in the context of elder law because elder refers to people who are aging, of course, but those who have disabilities, and that includes children, uh, teens, and young adults. Um, and so the purpose of today's discussion um, is somewhat, you know, end of life planning, um, which includes uh, a short discussion about government benefits um, and what you should be considering. Um, as you get older, because everyone knows the cost of care uh, in this country is very high. So some con considerations for, um, you know, planning for the inevitable illness uh, and old age. So I'm going to turn it over to Jackie, who is going to start with yeah. estate planning. Um, yeah. And I will jump in at any point. And if at any point anyone on Zoom um, has a question, feel free to use like the hand raise option. Um, and obviously, if anyone here has a question, feel free to raise your hand. Thank you. Unlike Donnie, I need notes, <laughs> so I'll be sure to cover everything. But thank you for having us. And I think you're all here probably because you have an appreciation for estate planning. Um, so I don't need to kind of tell you why it's important. Um, but briefly, why it is important is that we also as a firm do a state litigation and you would be surprised at how many folks end up either consulting a lawyer because something didn't go right in the probate of a loved one's estate um and i think part that part of that is because grief and loss just has people react and, and behave in unexpected ways so i think most of the folks that we represent in litigation or who come to us because there's a problem in their estate or the estate of a loved one never expected to be in that position so it's important that your documents that you leave for your family members are well written that they are um, legally enforceable and that they cover all the things that you want them to cover um, so estate planning is important also in particular to LGBTQ couples so that you are able to choose um, who will represent your interests, as well as for folks, even in blended families, second marriages, you can be surprised at the things that you don't think through and how those are the folks that we end up unfortunately talking to a lot in, in, in situations where a probate of an estate doesn't go the way you would have expected or that is the right or just way. So we usually recommend four main documents um, for folks to to have in and and have prepared. So the first, obviously, is your will. Um, oh, actually, I'm going to back that up and and remind you if you don't know that there's two different types of assets that you hold. You have probate assets, which go through and are instructed by your will, and then you have non-probate assets. So anything that has um, a, a beneficiary designation like a life insurance or if you have an investment or a retirement account where you name a beneficiary it doesn't matter what your will says who you name as the beneficiary is going to receive those assets so you want to make sure and check your beneficiary designations that they are aligned with how you want your assets distributed so that's a really important chime in? yeah chime. thank you just uh piggybacking off of what jackie was mentioning there are a lot of folks who um, change their beneficiary designations without considering the implications of doing so with respect to their estate generally. And so, you know, a person may come to us. I mean, we always ask, um, have you checked your beneficiary designations, whether that's on a 401k, an IRA or, or whatever sort of retirement account it might be. Um, you know, we will always ask people whether they've checked their beneficiary designations recently. 
Um, but for folks who don't, you know, um, see a lawyer or um, know better, unfortunately, they will have a will drawn up. It could be through Legal Zoom or one of those other, you know, legal softwares online, um, which doesn't provide you with the service of actually sitting down and talking to a lawyer, right? And so they will uh, draft up the fanciest legal Zoom will that they can think of, uh, or that the software can think of. Um, but they don't check their beneficiary designations. And sometimes what we wind up seeing is people have all of these accounts when they pass away that are being distributed vis-a-vis -vis the, de the beneficiary designations, and the will becomes useless, right? And so it's really important to look at both of those probate and non-probate assets, like Jackie mentioned, to consider the full picture uh, while you're doing your estate planning. And that's something that LegalZoom doesn't really advise you about. For sure. And I think a lot of us, and uh, if, if you're fortunate enough to stay at a job a long time, who you wrote down as your beneficiary designation when you either, you know, initially began a job and, and started with insurance or benefits through them, name somebody, and then have another kid or or whatever the situation may be it's really important to just revisit it check it and make sure it's aligned with how you want it to go. Um, so that's non probate probate so you have a will it does important things it names who is going to be the executor and 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 wrap up your estate. Um, it outlines the powers that that executor will have um, it determines how things will get distributed. So if you leave someone a home with a mortgage, does the estate pay the mortgage? Do they take the mortgage? There's small things like that. Or if they get a gift and taxes are due, does the estate pay the taxes? Does the person pay the taxes? Though taxes is not always, that's not my specialty. I will chime in. Yeah, <laughs> talk to him, that's him. With respect to um, estate administration and taxes, there are generally two types of what we call death taxes. The first is the estate tax. The, there is no New Jersey estate tax at the moment. That's not to say that it won't come back at some point, but at the moment there's no New Jersey estate tax. There is a federal estate tax, but the um, threshold for that for a single person is about $12 million. And so we don't encounter a lot of people who will have an estate tax you know, implication or, or trouble with the estate tax. The other form of death tax is the inheritance tax. There is an inheritance tax in New Jersey, and the inheritance tax is all about degree of relation to your beneficiaries. And so there are classes of beneficiaries, depending on how close they are blood-wise to you, your spouse and your children, um, they are considered class A beneficiaries. There is no in, uh, inheritance tax associated with leaving property or cash uh, to class A beneficiaries. On the other hand, there are some people, especially in the LGBT community, who have, you know, chosen family, this concept of chosen family, which is great, but not for inheritance tax purposes, because the, the government does not recognize chosen family when considering uh, applying inheritance taxes. And unfortunately, a friend, um, regardless of how close you are with that friend during your lifetime, will be taxed at the highest rate, which is about 16%. Um, so these are all important considerations, again, that LegalZoom might not warn you about, um, but that an elder law attorney or a trust and estates attorney can uh, mm -hmm. talk to you about. Yeah. The other important thing, I think, for folks that can, in, in creating a will, is to name a guardian for young children. Um, that's an important piece that and, and also to determine what you want to happen to money or assets that are left to young children. Um, and you think initially, well, my kids are adults, but what our job is, to, is to be prepared for the what ifs and the eventualities, God forbid, you have an adult child that predeceases you and your assets are left to a, a minor child. You wouldn't want that, you know, a 15 year old to get a substantial sum of money if, if you would want you would want to ensure that you name a trust that can hold on to that money so that it doesn't get, get caught up through guardianship uh, a guardianship court or a surrogate court to a point um, do that for you you can name that that uh, trustee for that minor trust uh, the other form that's kind of related to the will uh, that we generally recommend is a funeral agent form 
because the will, it takes a little time to probate. So you're going to name in your will who you want to, to direct the disposition of yourself after determine, you know, where, where your funeral will be, whether you'll be buried, whether you'll be cremated. So you can make those specifications on a funeral agent form and it's immediately available to you. So because there's a week or two or more before you become actually officially the executor, you have a funeral agent form, it allows you to make those decisions and have the authority to do that right away after someone passes. So that's the, the second important document. Um, and that's available actually online. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a law that passed in New Jersey a few years ago, 2019, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just an important, important piece to know. So then the next two forms that we recommend or, or to have is a- One more thing? Yeah, yeah. Just it came to yep, mind. Yep. Um, with respect to the will, and I'm sorry to backtrack for a second. Mm -hmm. With respect to a will and anyone who has a disabled child, even if that, per, even if that child is not technically a child, they're over the age of 18, um, you may wanna consider what's called a special needs trust. A special needs trust is designed to enable a individual under the age of 65 to receive money in trust from mom or dad's estate, right? Without that money disqualifying the child from government benefits that they may be on or may be considering. One of the topics I'm going to mention shortly is government benefits. Typically I'm referring to Medicaid, um, SSI, programs like th those two programs which are both means tested benefits, right? And so the government, when you're applying for SSI, when you're applying for Medicaid, look at both your assets and your income to determine eligibility. And so if an individual who is say 30 years old receives uh, a significant amount of money, $100,000, let's say, from the estate of mom and or dad, um, and they are on Medicaid, they can't have more than $2,000 in their name at any time unless or, or else they're disqualified from benefits. The special needs trust enables that individual to receive the money, not necessarily in their name, but in the name of the trust, but for their use, enjoyment, and benefit. And that's something that we add into the into wills oftentimes when a client tells us that they have a um, disabled adult child. And disability, just because I don't think I mentioned it, um, it's defined by the Social Security Administration, so that person will have to be um, determined disabled by the Social Security Administration um, in order to establish eligibility for a special needs trust. Before we move on from sure. uh, wills, wills mm -hmm. could you address uh, where people uh, who are benefits or who will remain in the will are overseas or in a different state sure. and or, uh, assets in Sure. So um, what you're referring to and, and the question, I'm not sure if everyone on Zoom was able to hear the question. The, the question was, um, uh, what happens if there is a beneficiary um, under a will who is maybe out of state or overseas? The role of the executor of the will is to not only determine who the beneficiaries are, but to make ultimately uh, distributions to those beneficiaries. And so if there is property out of state, for instance, we engage in a, um, a plan called ancillary probate, where we in New Jersey will then reach out to, you know, the surrogates court in Montana, for instance, um, or their equivalent, if they don't call it a sur surrogates court in Montana. We'll reach out to that court and, and engage in this ancillary probate process, whereby we have the authority to liquidate assets in, in that um, state um, and make distributions to any potential beneficiaries who may be living out of state. With respect to beneficiaries who are living outside of the country, that's really where the executor has a, a big job to do, right? It, it is their responsibility, responsibility ultimately to locate those beneficiaries and make a proper distribution to them. And so, you know, each time that we encounter this issue, we handle it a little bit differently depending on the country that we're dealing with. Um, typically, you know, the Western European countries, are, it's very easy um, to find people and, and um, you know, ultimately make a distribution to them. But if we're dealing with, you know, one of the, one of the most difficult 
areas of, of the world, I think, to, to handle an ancillary probate for us is South America, um, because you have to go through the consulate. So depending on the country where that beneficiary is located or where that property is located, um, depends on the, on the degree of, of hardship that we might encounter. But um, ordinarily, we reach out to the appropriate government entity in the area to find somebody if we're looking for a beneficiary and uh, have them assist with the probate. You're welcome. And that, that made me also think, to, so for your information, a will and where you probate someone's will is, is in the county that they resided in at the time of their death. Um, and you could move from New Jersey at that point but your New Jersey will is generally still valid mm -hmm. in any state. So it's not important. It's not necessary to, if you decide to move to another state to immediately get a new will, you can move elsewhere. Your New Jersey will is a, still a valid will in another state, but your will, but it will be probated in, in the county that you pass away within where you resided at, uh, at that time. That's a great point. And, and another important thing, I think people also hear, oh, sorry, go ahead. It would typically be New Jersey law that would apply. And then another thing that I think I, that wasn't on my notes, but I think is an important thing to know is that people also think about using a trust to avoid to avoid some of the probate procedure. And in some states, that's an important piece. Um, in New Jersey, probate is fairly quick. It's fairly inexpensive compared to most. And we don't generally, unless there's a situation like a disabled child or a, a more complex will with, with multiple properties in different states, for the most part, your average person doesn't really need a trust. The will, using your will to, to use your assets to be passed is, and, and to go through probate is not a big complicated procedure. If we were in Florida, it would be a different situation. It's long, it's expensive, and if you dump it in a trust, your, your assets into a trust, it's much more direct and it's worth doing. Here, there's really not, in New Jersey, there's really not a need for that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, is. Wills, we good? <laughs> yeah. Maybe not to each nonprofit, but, but perhaps to a, uh, uh, an individual. And it's better to simply put a little note uh, in your will saying, by the way, I, I want my sister in law to get $10,000 a month, as opposed to putting it in the will so she has to pay tax money. Does that make any sense to you? I'm, I'm glad you asked it because the, the tax questions are probably our most common questions when we're having this discussion. I'm gonna talk about the church first. Um, with respect to naming church as a beneficiary, a church is considered a class E beneficiary under New Jersey's inheritance uh, tax law. And so class E beneficiaries, there's no tax associated with it. Um, so the answer is no, there would be no tax if you included the church in, in your will. With respect to your sister-in-law, your sister-in-law is considered a class, I believe, D beneficiary, right? Um, and so they will be taxed at the highest rate, just like a friend. So um, again, it's all about the degree of relation and whether or not your beneficiary is a charity. They're a charity, no tax, but if they're distant or not blood family, they're gonna get taxed. Great question. But spouse, Thank you. children, grandchildren are class A mm -hmm. and they're exempt. <clears throat> right, any other questions before we move on from the will? No? Okay. Good. Yeah. I also have one other quick will thing, just so you're clear on, on the types of property you have. You have personal property, which can be used with a note. That's the type of thing that generally our wills will use what's in called incorporated by reference. So we're going to say, if there's a list that you find with this that leaves this ring to so-and-so, and personal property is your car, your, your collectibles, your jewelry, <clears throat> your firearms, that type of thing. So that's your personal property, and then the, the rest of your estate is is your your in, you know your investment accounts or your cash, or if you, they don't have beneficiary designations, your home, your real estate. That's that goes. That's a kind of called your rest and residue and remainder of your estate. But personal property can be at least how we write wills, and many folks do with reference a list that you can change, that you can decide. Hey, okay, I wanted to leave this this piece of art to so-and-so and you leave it with the will. And then that, that's something that can be 
ripped up and changed without going through writing a whole new will. Um, anyway, that was an aside. So then we go to powers of attorney, which give appoint another person to be uh, and take to, and manage your legal and financial affairs. Um, obviously, that's an important piece. If you're ever to become incapacitated or un unable to manage your affairs, it allows you to decide who's going to step in and make those decisions and take care of your affairs for you. Um, if you don't have that, unfortunately, the procedure is someone would have to go apply to the court to become your guardian, which is a bit you know, more expensive. It's not up to you. It gets decided by whoever brings that application. It's a kind of a long drawn out process. Uh, we do a lot of guardianships and sometimes it's just necessary. But if you have a power of attorney, you've picked someone, you've picked a successor in case that person isn't available. Um, you know, it's, it's a really important piece as well as a living will. That's the other second piece which appoints someone to take care of your um, health care affairs, make those decisions for you. Um, and also can direct what you wish to have happen or not happen at the end of life with regard to your care. And that's my spiel. <laughs> I typically say that the power of attorney, in my mind, is you know the single most important document you should be considering. Um, the reason for that is banks and financial institutions are very hesitant to deal with anyone other than an account owner for liability reasons. You know, if you have a spouse and spouse one is hospitalized and there's no living will, nine times out of 10, the doctors will listen to the, the well spouse, right? It's not as strict. However, I'm not saying it's not important to, to not have a, or to not have a living will, right? I just think that the power of attorney is really critical, especially with the rates of dementia and various types of dementia that we see nowadays, um, where people are you know, losing capacity, even at earlier ages, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's very important to name someone who can take over your affairs um, in the event you become incapacitated. And that's what the power of attorney seeks to do. It, it's to appoint that agent. Jackie mentioned that um, the alternative, if someone does not have a power of appointment, a power of attorney, they become incapacitated, you know, they need to go to a nursing home. That's the most common scenario we run into, or they need some sort of skilled nursing care, and there's no one that can pay their bills for them. You know, people will come to us and, and, and say, what do we do? And the answer is typically a guardianship. Um, and as Jackie mentioned, the guardianship process is long drawn out, especially in Essex County. Essex County um, surrogate is there's a huge backlog and it's very difficult to uh, slosh through um, the, the weight at the Essex County surrogate, but also expensive because most people, you know, become uh, or, or seek out legal representation for a guardianship and it's a court process. So it takes time um, and it can become very expensive. Nine times out of 10, you can avoid the guardianship process by having a power of attorney. It's not always going to solve the issues. Um, you know, one of the um, most common uh, scenarios that we encounter where people who have signed a power of attorney um, and who still require a guardianship involves long-term care planning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the power of attorney is not necessarily strong and there's no gifting provision in that power of attorney. And gifting is a big part of long-term care planning for us, for paying for something like skilled nursing care. And if that power of attorney, if the, the principal or the, um, the person who signs the power of attorney is incapacitated in a nursing home and they're considering applying for Medicaid to pay for nursing home care, and there's no gifting provision in that power of attorney, there becomes a huge issue because it forecloses on our ability to engage in what we call a Medicaid plan. And I'm going to touch on that in a minute. So there are situations, there are scenarios where people, even with the power of attorney, it might not be a great one, come to us and there's still a need for guardianship. And I, I think there's also an, it's important to know that if that idea of leaving someone the power to gift away your assets is uncomfortable for you, you can have a power of attorney that's called a springing power of attorney, as opposed to one that goes into immediate effect that is one that is protected by the, uh, it doesn't become effective until two doctors or one doctor or however you design it signs off and says, yes, this person is incapacitated, they cannot manage their affairs. And if you, but you know, maybe you're older, you do, you have this oncoming illness, you can have one that's immediate. It's your comfort level though. If you are 
my power of attorney is springing. I don't have, it's, it will take effect down the road if and when I become, it's not, it's not springing for my spouse, but it's springing for my children. So you have a lot of ways that you can be comfortable with handing over these, the power to manage your affairs to someone else. All right. Any questions about power of attorney or living will before I bore you to death with government benefits? <laughs> um, just go over again. Give things. Sure. Who gives what to whom? Sure. Most often times in our powers of attorney that we draft, we enable the agent under power of attorney, not the person who signed the power of attorney. I'll refer to them as the principal, but the person they're appointing as their agent the power of attorney would be permitted to gift assets of the principal to anyone who would receive under the principal's will. If there's no will, I mean, we typically draft a will if we're doing a power of attorney and there's no will, but if there's no will, um, we would only enable people who would benefit under New Jersey's intestacy laws to receive gifts. And, and just to be clear, the, the idea of the gifting is to reduce your assets so that you call he'll, he'll get into this in a minute but it's sort of a it's to do the spend down that you've probably heard of that you can reduce your assets to qualify for medicaid because long-term care is so expensive that mm -hmm. that this is just how it has developed the program has developed <clears throat> anything else okay all right so i'm going to start with medicare and medicaid uh, many of you know Medicare is offered to people who are 65 and older, or those who have a qualifying disability, or those who have been receiving Social Security disability for a um, continuous period of two years or longer. That's Medicare. Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Medicare will pay for subacute rehab up to 100 days, although those 100 days are not guaranteed. Uh, it depends on how you're progressing with the subacute rehab, but Medicare is there to cover hospital bills, right? It's there to cover outpatient doctor's visits, uh, you know, uh, trips in an ambulance, um, and subacute rehab up to 100 days. Um, you can have a Part D plan that pays for prescription drugs uh, or a portion of prescription drugs, um, but that's Medicare. When I'm referring, when I when I talk about Medicaid. I'm talking about a impoverishment program. It's a form of means-tested benefits that will pay for long-term care, either in a nursing home, skilled nursing facility, or assisted living facility. Oh, and I should mention, just because of you know, the group I'm speaking to, Medicare does have hospice coverage. That hospice coverage allows people who um, have been, and, and in order to qualify for hospice, you need to have a hospice doctor and your primary care doctor attest to the fact that you have six months, in their opinion, or less to live. Um, so long as you have those two doctors signing off on that hospice certification, you can qualify for hospice. And hospice is offered in um, you know, a private residence. You can have aides come, hospice aides, um, or you can go to a facility. Um, the problem with going to a facility for hospice care is even if you're receiving Medicare's hospice benefit, you're still required to pay the normal room and board, which can be very expensive. But those who receive hospice care at home, for instance, like my grandfather received hospice care at home, it was completely free. Um, we did have to pay uh, extra for um, you know, certain things, but uh, it was very reasonable. Um, so I figured that was important to mention before I jumped into Medicaid. It's a very generous program too. Mm -hmm. the, the hospice hospice care that's covered by Medicare is broad. It's a lot. It covers quite a bit. Hospital bed, equipment. I'm just wondering, the, the 100 days that you mentioned, mm -hmm. is that for a year or is that a lifetime benefit? There is a lifetime exclusionary limit in Medicare, um, but it's typically per qualifying visit to the hospital. And a qualifying visit is a... Um, amount of time that you have to be in the hospital before the clock resets for your Medicare days. And it's three days. Uh, a qualifying visit for, for Medicare is three days. Any other questions? Okay. Also, that rule, that three-day rule was relaxed during COVID, but we're back to it again. Um, 
With respect to Medicaid, as many of you may know, the cost of long-term care in this country is ridiculous. Uh, the cost, average cost in this area of an assisted living is about $8,000 to $10,000 a month. The average cost of nursing home care is typically between $12,000 and $15,000 a month. It is ridiculously expensive. The average cost of home care, what would you say, $5,000 to $7,000? Yeah. 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 For, you know, having aides come to the house, um, you know, we, we typically see between five to $7,000 that we tell people to budget for. But, um, you know, home care is not always an option for people, especially if hands-on care is, is really important. Medicaid does offer a home care benefit. The problem with Medicaid's home care benefit is that Medicaid will only pay for up to 40 hours per week of in-home care. Contrast that to Medicaid's institutional benefit, which is, you know, your butt is in a, a nursing home bed, right? They're there 24 seven, able to assist you when necessary. So unfortunately, the way the program is structured, it disproportionately favors institutional level of care um, which, unfortunately, again, forecloses on some people's ability to remain at home if there are no other supports, you know, in excess of the 40 hours a week. And so people will come to us most, uh, most oftentimes and say, my wife and I have $200,000 left in our names. And, you know, my wife now requires a nursing home placement. She has dementia. She has, a, you know, another debilitating illness that necessitates uh, long-term care. What do we do? You know, we're told that Medicaid um, requires a person to spend down to less than $2,000 a month. That's also um, something that I'll talk about. If there is a spouse, it's not necessarily $2,000. We'll get to that in a second. But, you know, people hear things and uh, often believe them that aren't necessarily true. Um, but they come to us and say, you know, we're, we're facing a nursing home placement imminently and, and we have $2,000, she's not gonna qualify, but if I'm paying $15,000 a month for nursing home care, I'm gonna have no money in a year. It's a serious concern, right? And so what do you do? We typically engage in two types of long-term care plans to help pay for uh, long-term care. In the situation that I just, just described, that person would be a good candidate for what I call crisis Medicaid planning. Crisis Medicaid planning, and I'm, I'm going to paint this picture for you with very broad brush strokes because it becomes very confusing, but crisis Medicaid planning involves utilizing a gift and offsetting the gift with the purchase of a Medicaid compliant annuity. In New Jersey, when you make a Medicaid application, Medicaid has this thing called a five-year look back. That five-year look back, what are they doing? What is Medicaid doing when they're looking back into your, your finances for the five years preceding the Medicaid application? The government is looking for any transfer of a resource that could include money, could include a house, a car, anything that you own. They're looking for a transfer of a resource for less than fair market value. And what Medicaid does is they add up the fair market value of everything that was transferred for less than fair market value and for every $11,000 that was gifted or transferred, Medicaid will impose a one month penalty on the Medicaid applicant. What is a penalty? A penalty is merely a period of time that Medicaid will not pay for services, whether that's at home or in a nursing home or an assisted living facility. And so what we do with the crisis Medicaid plan is gift a portion of the assets. And now we know that gifting creates a penalty, right? I said, with the remaining portion of the assets that, is, that are not gifted, we purchase this Medicaid compliant annuity. And what that annuity does is it will pay the Medicaid applicant for the exact period of time that we're anticipating the gift penalty to run so that the person can remain in the nursing home with their bed fully paid for while also preserving the chunk of money that was gifted. In my scenario, my hypothetical with a couple that comes to me with $200,000 and they desperately want to hold on to some of that money, maybe for their children or for their grandchildren, we would be able to gift a portion of that $200,000 to the uh, children or grandchildren so that we can effectuate their wish to leave something. It's almost like a advance on their inheritance 
while also qualifying them for Medicaid at a much earlier date. That is what we call a crisis Medicaid plan. Um, and I'm sure I lost many of you because it's not very easy to understand. But um, does anyone have any questions about that sort of planning? No, okay. Sure. I feel like if you look at it to say, if, if you know, okay, suddenly I have, a, a, you know, suddenly you need to be in the nursing home and you have this $200,000 in the bank and you just want to hand it to your kid or you want to transfer the title of your house to your kid and be like, so now I only have $2,000, let me get on Medicaid. Medicaid looks at that and says, if that happened in the last five years, you're penalized and we're going to take the amount we're going to, it's roughly $11,000 a month. So if you gifted $100,000 or your house was worth $100,000 and you handed it over to your kid to get your assets down under $2,000, they're going to look at that and say, we're going to take ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 a month. We're going to take that divided, you, you gifted $100,000, 10 months is how long it's going to be until your Medicaid kicks in. So you're going to have to figure out a way to pay for your nursing home for those 10 months after that 10 months goes by, Medicaid will pay for it and you're all set. So it's that period of penalty period that Donnie mentioned, that then there are other strategies that he can, that, that then, right. you, then you employ something like the Medicaid compliant annuity. Sure. Can I call my broker and ask if they compliant annuity? Great question. You don't have to go through an elder law firm for them, but I only know of two, maybe three now, um, brokers that offer these Medicaid compliant annuities throughout the entire country. And we use two of them typically, depending on the amount of the annuity. Um, we use two of those three. And so it's not a very well-known product. And most people, if you speak to your broker and talk to them about it, um, they may not know what a Medicaid compliant annuity is. Um, and if they do think they know what it is, I would recommend before you put any money into it to have an attorney look at it to make sure that it's going to pass the sniff test for Medicaid, so to say. All right, anything else? I do, I have, uh, we have folders and goodie bags for everyone. Sure. That's right. Great question. The question for everyone on, on um, Zoom was, um, you know, since Medicaid is both a federal and state program, is Medicaid, the sort of Medicaid planning I'm talking about, um, only offered in New Jersey or is it offered in other states? And the answer is it's offered in uh, the other states. Uh, Medicaid is in fact a federal program, um, but it, under the terms of the program, it's administered through the states at the county level. And so if you live in Essex County, New Jersey, when we make a Medicaid application for you, we're making that uh, Medicaid application with the Essex County Board of Social Services, um, who will then determine eligibility. For Medicaid, there are long-term care Medicaid. There are two, generally two eligibility criteria. First is the financial that we mentioned for a single person applying for Medicaid, they have to have less than $2,000 to qualify. And the second is a clinical eligibility criteria. That means under Medicaid's regulations, the, the person who's applying for Medicaid must require assistance with three or more of their activities of daily living. Those activities of daily living are bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring from bed to chair, or chair to bed, uh, ambulating, you know, walking, getting around, or remembering to do certain things like feeding themselves, taking their medications, et cetera. Three or more, requiring three or more uh, 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 assistance with those th uh, three uh, activities of daily living is necessary uh, to qualify clinically for Medicaid. And for those for Medicaid, which Doug and Kathy might have uh, benefited by their, their Medicaid compliant annuities to pay for penalties uh, when you're oh, no, for that gap of time when you're penalized. I'm not sure who's talking either. I'm just gonna mute everyone on Zoom oh, if you go. um thank you. If I can remember how to do that. Okay. Thank you. Um all right, so the second type of, of Medicaid plan that we do for folks who are a little bit more proactive and not in crisis mode 
is a type of trust planning. Sometimes we refer to it as five-year planning. As I mentioned, Medicaid has this five-year look-back rule. And so the idea, generally, um, someone or a couple comes to us who are, are relatively healthy um, and uh, they have assets. Um, and they say to us, well, you know, we want to plan for the future. And we know the cost of long-term care is very high. Um, but, you know, uh, we're not multimillionaires. Um, we've done all right for ourselves, like most people uh, in, the, in the middle class, or what's left of the middle class, I should say. Um, and, you know, we want to be able to preserve something for our children uh, or grandchildren. And so as long as the couple who are, is coming to us is, is relatively healthy, you know, I, I hate to slap a label on, you know, age, um, but typically I'm not a fan of doing this sort of five-year trust planning for anyone 90 or over. Um, but, you know, relatively young, relatively healthy, um, and just concerned about saving money for the next generation, we will fund what is called an irrevocable trust. You might hear me refer to it as a family trust or a Medicaid trust. Um, but the idea is to fund that irrevocable trust sooner rather than later with the hope that Medicaid is not required in the five years after funding the trust so that after year five, the money in that trust is no longer considered an asset to the individual and cannot be penalized by Medicaid so long as the Medicaid application is made five years after the funding of the trust. The downside to this type of trust planning is that the person who's setting up the trust, they're what's known as the grantor. The grantor has to name a trustee. With these types of Medicaid trusts, the grantor cannot be a trustee. The trustee cannot be the grantor. And so you have to have someone you know and trust serving in that fiduciary capacity as a trustee to look over the money that you're putting in the trust. A lot of people don't feel comfortable doing that. But for those that do, it could be a really useful option. A lot of people are also concerned about putting money in the trust because in order to qualify or pass the sniff test for Medicaid, the grantor cannot have access to that money because if they have access to the money, it's considered a resource and Medicaid will count it. And so the question becomes, I'm gonna take $200,000 and put it in this trust and not be able to touch it. What if I need that money in the future? And there is somewhat of an unspoken, but I'm gonna speak about it now, rule um, with these trusts. Typically people will name a child or a grandchild, niece, nephew, someone they trust as the trustee of the trust. And if there comes a point where the grantor, the person funding the trust needs the money, that trustee can then make a distribution of the funds in the trust to the beneficiary. Nine times out of 10, we have the trustee named as a beneficiary as well. So the trustee can authorize a distribution of the money from the trust to the beneficiary. It's kind of like this person's wearing two caps, to right? Themselves. To themselves. And then pay the grantor, not directly from the trust, but from them, almost like a gift, right? And so, and I hate to use the word gift because that has Medicaid implications, implications. but it, it's, a, it's a gift in the non-Medicaid world. Um, it's just a, a, a turning over funds so that the grantor can access the money, just not directly. But that sort of five-year planning is proactive planning, and it, it may be something you want to consider as well. Um, we see, you know, five-year plans just as often as we see the crisis Medicaid plans. Um, but generally, those are the two types of Medicaid planning options that are available to people, um, and, and both are equally as good with the idea being that You've worked so hard for your money, your spouse maybe worked so hard for his or her money, and you have the option of spending it all on the cost of a nursing home or preserving a portion of that to give to the next generation. And most people opt for the latter. And to be clear, you put assets into a trust, but you retain some. It's not like you're saying, I'm going to completely impoverish myself while I do this five year this five year wait out before I apply to Medicaid, mm -hmm. you keep some money, you keep 100 grand, you use this for the next five years, it's okay to have some money, because you're using it, you're spending it on yourself at full market value, these aren't going to be things that you gift, but if you did need something 
a repair on your home, you want to take a trip, you tell your trustee, they take that money out of the trust, give it to themselves, they can do whatever they want with it. And of course, you trust them. That's the why it's called a trust. And you they will give it to you for whatever expense you need. So that's what's unspoken um, that we're speaking about. One may, may require long term medical uh, help, but the other is still you know, healthy. Mm -hmm. And so, does, does this sort of plan work to allow the person that's still healthy to have a lifestyle that uh, you know, gives them you know, good lifestyle rather than have to lose their right. as well as support the spouse? The answer is yes. Um, your spouse cannot be named as the beneficiary or the trustee, um, but uh, the rules surrounding uh, the funding of the trust um, and the distributions out of the trust equally apply to people who um, have a spouse. Is, yes. Is there a tax consequence to the trustee who takes that money for themselves and then uses it for the grantor's benefit? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Um, there may be an income tax uh, consequence associated with it. Um, so we will oftentimes tell the trustee uh, that if they intend on touching the money before they touch the money to have a, a discussion with their um, accountant. Thank you. All right, so it looks like we've got about six or seven minutes left. I'm done with my spiel. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll just open the floor up to anyone. Yep. I just wanted a little more clarity on the, on the spending manager. Sure. What Medicaid counts against you mm -hmm. is only gifts, right? Mm -hmm. If you were spending it on your regular life expenses, that's right. You're paying market value insurance, right? Those, so you can retain assets and use them, right, for your own right life, right? And that doesn't disqualify you. That's right. Medicaid defines a gift of a transfer of an asset or assets for less than fair market value. But if you are going out to dinner, if you are going to the movies, um, you know, you're spending money on medications, personal care items, even paying for aides to come to the house to help you or a spouse. Those are not transfers of assets for less than fair market value. You're receiving a benefit. And that doesn't require a waiting period where you can access those. That's right. You can spend money on assets. Exactly. Medicaid does require five years of your financial records to apply. They do look at it. I mean, they will scrutinize those things, but it's not less than fair market value. That's fine. One important point that I did not mention that I should is a Medicaid applicant who is married is treated differently than a single person, someone who's applying for Medicaid who is not married, in terms of the resources that Medicaid looks at. A married Medicaid applicant, regardless of whether the spouse is applying for Medicaid benefits or not, a married Medicaid applicant would be able to preserve money for the benefit of what we call the community spouse, the spouse who is not applying for Medicaid. Each year, there is a number that the state of New Jersey typically raises um, to permit the community spouse to retain a maximum amount of money or assets so that they don't become impoverished. In 2023, what's known as the, and that's known as a community spouse resource allowance or a CESRA, we refer to it as. That CESRA this year is about $128,000. And the CESRA is calculated by taking the first date of institutionalization. You know, so um, let me illustrate that. Um, you know, husband and wife, husband needs nursing home services. Husband enters the nursing home on September 20, let's say 5th, 24th. Husband enters the nursing home on September 24th. And Medicaid will say, husband went into the nursing home in September and they will look to September 1st assets. So as of September 1st, what did the husband and wife own, either individually or jointly? They will add up all of those assets, divide it by, by two, and then that number is the CESRA. Anything in excess of $128,000 um, 
Did I say 128? I think it's 168. 168,000, sorry. $168,000, anything in excess of that amount, um, when you divide the total resources in half, you're, you're maxed out. You can only keep 168,000, you would have to spend down to the 168,000. Um, contrast that to a single Medicaid applicant, they're only entitled to $2,000, no, you know, no more than $2,000. Um, so in many ways, having a spouse when you're applying for Medicaid who's alive um, is beneficial. Great question, because it varies from state to state. There was a, the question for people on Zoom was what about pensions? Um, the answer to that question varies from state to state. In New Jersey, a pension that can be liquidated is considered an asset, unfortunately. Um, in New York, for instance, a pension that is currently being paid out is considered income. Um, and so it what might not necessarily disqualify the person from getting on Medicaid. But a pension that can be liquidated in New Jersey for a lump sum benefit um, will be considered an asset. If it cannot be liquidated, it's considered income. Um, and in 2023, there is an income cap in New Jersey for Medicaid, um, but it's a, a soft cap because if your income exceeds, and I believe it's $2,400-ish per month, um, you need to use something called a qualified income trust. And I'm not going to go into the weeds with this qualified income trust because it's equally as confusing to you as it is to me. At least the, the need for it, it makes no sense, but we do it. Um, but if your income exceeds that 2,400-ish dollars a month, um, you, you have to use this type of trust called a qualified income trust to qualify for Medicaid. But, and it's just a mechanism by which you can use your assets to pay for your long-term care. Right. It's just a funnel that they allow. It's right. just a hoop. But the answer to your question is, it depends on whether it can be liquidated for a lump sum or not. Uh, if it can, you have to liquidate it in New Jersey. If you cannot liquidate it, um, and it's just going to continue paying out for your life lifetime, um, then you will likely have to count the amount of pension, the gross amount of the pension you receive, uh, add that to the gross amount of the social security that you may be receiving and any other sort of monthly income to determine whether your income exceeds that $2,600, $2,400 a month. Um, and if it does, we would have to use a qualified income trust. Same question uh, goes to overseas pensions. Mm -hmm. Same question. I actually just had a case like that um, recently where there was a pension from the UK and the UK pension um, was paying out to the tune of like $400 a month or so, but it could be liquidated. And so Medicaid, and we didn't realize it could be liquidated because the pension paperwork was so old that it was lost. And Medicaid, you know, it's the government. They, can, they have their ways of looking into things that we may not. Um, they discovered that it could be liquidated and said, we're not going to let you apply for Medicaid until you liquidate that pension. Anything else? No? All right, well, it was a pleasure speaking with you. I have Thank goodie you. bags and folders up here. Um, the folders have our recent newsletter that have topics that we probably didn't even cover today that may be of interest to you, um, as well as our contact information. And we have a sheet. We have an Elder Law monthly newsletter if you want to give us your email. We don't spam you. We promise. Just the Elder Law newsletter. Our goodie bags have stress balls, and yes. I'm sure you can all use them. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone on Zoom. Thank you very much. And there's someone wants to collect. There was one Zoom question there. Yes, we'll collect. And yes, we'll have the handouts. Um, I'll entrust them to Pastor Ron, and we'll have them at the Wednesday Older Adult Meeting and, and other places. So thanks for being with us. Bye.